KDE is without a doubt a very popular Linux desktop environment. It is easily the second most popular. And there are some major Linux distros out there like Manjaro that do ship it as a default. But when you think of the biggest Linux distros like Ubuntu, like Fedora, like a ton of other distros, they all ship GNOME as their default desktop. Now, some of these do have KDE as an option, but in many cases, like with Ubuntu, it's relegated to a flavor. In Fedora, it's relegated to a spin. But how did this come to be? While I can't say definitively, I can make a pretty educated guess. Now, a lot of the Linux boomers in the audience may know this, but a lot of other people probably don't. KDE is actually the older project by three years. KDE started in 1996. GNOME didn't hit the scene until 1999. This was years before either Fedora or Ubuntu hit the scene, with 03 and 04 respectively. And even though GNOME was seen as this, like, new up-and-comer, it had a massive advantage over KDE. GTK. Not the feature set of GTK, the license of GTK. For better or worse, during this time, the FSF had a much much greater influence on Linux. This was during like the 90s and early 2000s. And if your project didn't have a license that was compatible in some way with the GPL, basically that project went in the bin. GTK has always been licensed under some variation of the LGPL. QT, on the other hand, has not always been like this. When QT or Qt for those people out there first started in 1995, the Windows and the Linux version were actually licensed differently. The Linux version is the one we care about though, this used the QT Free Edition license. This was completely incompatible with the GPL. This was used from 1995 until 1999. But during that period, in 1996, KDE was created. And unlike many of the projects using something not compatible with the GPL, this kind of got a lot of attention and was really popular on the Linux desktop. But the license being what it is, basically a proprietary license, this led to quite a bit of controversy. And QT was not what it is today. KDE was basically the biggest project using the library. And when that controversy happened, they kinda had to listen. People were worried that maybe at some point Trolltech would decide, we're gonna charge for the Linux version, we're gonna, like, cut off features and only put them in a paid version. Maybe they'll disappear at some point and KDE is just left there pretty much dead. Everyone was worried what was gonna happen to KDE. So eventually, the license was replaced with the QPL, the Q Public License. This was a copyleft license that Trolltech felt was a good free software license. But it was not compatible with the GPL as it fails the Debian FOSS guidelines and other organizations weren't exactly happy with the license. It was certainly better, but it still wasn't great. After much discussion between KDE and Trolltech at the time the owners of QT, this led to the creation of the KDE Free QT Foundation, guaranteeing that the Linux version of QT, should Trolltech maybe go bankrupt, fail, there's a buyout, the new owners want to do something, that the Linux version will be re that the Linux version will be relicensed under a BSD style license. Now the KDE Free QT Foundation does still exist, it does still have board members, and you can find all the information about this on the KDE website. But the problem mostly went away with the release of QT 2.2. This was released under GPL v2. Now, later down the line, Trolltech was actually acquired by Nokia.
yes, that Nokia that used to make phones, this was done in 2008. And with the release of QT 4.5, they added the option of LGPL 3.0. So it doesn't really matter that this exists, but it is nice to still see it around. But that early history did really hurt the adoption of KDE. During that time, GNOME came out, and GNOME didn't have any of these problems. But that early history really put a dent into KDE's reputation, and really put a dent into KDE's adoption. And during that time, in 1999, GNOME hit the scene. And GNOME was pretty good from the start, it's still GNOME. It was GNOME from the start. This didn't have any of the KDE problems and allowed it to get a really early foothold that it probably wouldn't have got otherwise. But that's not the only thing that's happened in Linux's history. Let's skip ahead a few more years to 2004, specifically the initial release of Ubuntu. Ubuntu 4.10 Warty Warthog. I've looked at this on stream and you know what? It's, it's GNOME, it's Ubuntu, like, the foundation of what Ubuntu was going to be, like, you know, 19 years later, was already there. Yes, it was a little bit more brown. Yes, it had a little bit more sound effects. But you can see what they were going for from that really early point. They were aiming to be a very user-friendly distro. And this was a much bigger deal back then. Like nowadays, you know, getting drivers, getting all of this fun stuff installed, pretty straightforward. Back then, yeah, you could legitimately find a distro that didn't have the drivers you need, and you'd have to go and like compile them, and it would have been a giant mess. But Ubuntu was trying to make it as easy to use as using, I guess it would have been, what, was XP out at the time? Maybe. Yes, by today's standards, Warty Warthog and that very early version of GNOME is very rough around the edges. It is clearly a diamond in the rough. You can say it's something else in the rough, but we'll go with diamond. But even so, it was still this incredibly impressive distro and it gained massive popularity for the time. In many ways, it very quickly became the face of Linux and what the rest of the world sees Linux as. They either see a command line, or they see GNOME and Ubuntu. And to absolutely nobody's surprise, many distros ended up copying this, because if Ubuntu can be successful by doing this, clearly everybody else can be successful by doing the exact same thing with literally zero innovation. It doesn't work out that way, but everyone thought it did. You've probably also heard that KDE is really buggy, and without a doubt, KDE does have bugs. Every bit of software is going to, and anybody honest in the project is going to admit that. But much like with things like Pulse Audio, a lot of that bugginess isn't its current state, it's actually how the project first started. In the case of KDE, specifically in 2008, with the release of KDE 4.0. Now, a lot of people remember some of the later updates, like 4.1, 4.2, when things actually started to get good. But 4.0, to put it lightly, was not in the best of states. There were missing features, applications were unstable, it was prone to the desktop just completely crashing, it was not ready for the average user to be using. And that was the intention. That is why the developers released it. They released it to gauge feedback on this new version of KDE before they were fully ready with 4.1, 4.2 and so on. They made this very, very clear when they were doing their developer blogs in the repo, all of this fun stuff. The issue, and the thing that a lot of projects tend to do, is they completely forget that most people don't follow everything a project is doing. So when KDE 4.0 hit people's repos, people just installed it, assuming it was ready, 
assuming that, you know, it's called 4.0. Clearly, they wouldn't call it 4.0 if it wasn't ready to use. When it shipped out, it was widely criticized and generally panned by the users. There were even some people calling for a fork of KDE. Uh, <laughs> this actually did lead to a desktop existing. That desktop being the Trinity desktop. You can still use it today. Not only is this a fork of KDE 3.5, it's also using a really old version of QT, which they now maintain in-house to keep doing what they've always been doing. But due to the fork and all the backlash, eventually the KDE team did have to respond. As we firmly believe in KDE 4 and the future of the free desktop, we expected the heated discussions about KDE 4 and especially the 4.0 release to go away, and we were wrong about that. The problems are largely due to inflated expectations of KDE 4, something KDE developers had attempted to address ahead of the release. KDE 4.0 was never intended to be a full replacement for KDE 3, but was released in January in order to give KDE 4 applications a stable platform to develop to. Not releasing 4.0 at that point means holding back hundreds of application developers from porting and releasing their applications. Honestly, what they should have done, 4.0, RC1. Make it very clear, this is not 4.0, the release version that's ready to be used. This is a release candidate. Don't ship it to regular people. And you might be saying, well, this was 14, 15 years ago. It's not that big of a deal anymore. And yes, it shouldn't be. But there are people, even though it was 26 years ago, who still bring up the licensing issue with QT. There are people right now who are in high school, like well on through high school, who were literally not born when QT was still a proprietary library. And even so, there are people who don't know how QT is licensed and think it is a proprietary project. It is not at all. And this idea of bugginess is always going to stick around with KDE. Now we talked about Ubuntu, but what about Red Hat and its derivatives? Why does Red Hat care so much about GNOME? Well, it's not really great to frame it like that. It's much better to frame it in the other direction. Why does GNOME care so much about Red Hat? GNOME basically wouldn't exist, at least in the state it's in today, in as good of a state as it is, without Red Hat. From the start, not like, you know, five, ten years down the line, literally from the start of the project, Red Hat has been involved in GNOME. Some of the early commits done on GNOME were being done by Red Hat employees as a Red Hat employee. Like, they were specifically tasked to work on this project. Red Hat has given GNOME a lot of funding, and while GNOME is certainly a separate organization, they wouldn't be anywhere near as competent without Red Hat being involved. This is a big part of the reason why GNOME at all could compete with KDE at the start. If it was just, you know, like a handful of developers, they were not going up against KDE, this massively established desktop. They needed outside help. And maybe if Red Hat wasn't involved, when Canonical got around to making the first version of Ubuntu, Maybe they would have decided to use something that wasn't GNOME. Maybe we would live in a world right now where Ubuntu had a KDE desktop and KDE was the primary desktop environment on Linux. GNOME, much like KDE, is a great desktop environment. I know they both have their fans and one of them is going to like, no, this is bad about that. The other is like, no, that's bad about that. But they're both great desktop environments that suit different kinds of people. And a big part of the reason why GNOME is used on so many distros is that early rivalry it had with KDE. And now that it's where it is, it's really hard to make a massive shift. Like, imagine the next version of Ubuntu came out and suddenly was using KDE. Like, that's a night and day user experience change 
and just wouldn't really fly. So now that Gnome is just so established, it's not really going to go anywhere. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Let me know in the comment section down below. What desktop do you run? Do you even use a desktop environment? Do you use a desktop? Are you watching me uh, through some sort of like frame buffer on your TTY? I would love to know. So if you like this video, remember to go and like the video. And if you really like the video and you want to become one of these amazing people over here, go check out my Patreon, Scrab, Sally, Berapay, linked in the description down below. That's going to be it for me, and... Um, I don't actually think of these outros before we get here. Uh... K... I, I actually have nothing. I have nothing at all. Bye!